Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I am departing from my usual custom and not preaching from the lectionary. I have for you an additional reading from St. Luke chapter 1. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him Zechariah after his father. But his mother answered, No, he shall be called John. And they said to her, None of your relatives is called by this name. And they made signs to his father, inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And they all wondered. And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed, and he spoke, blessing God. And fear came on all their neighbors. And all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This past Friday, June the 24th, was a day of celebration in the life of the church. And you all know why. It's because it was the nativity of St. John the Baptist. Very good. Uh, June the 24th, always on the liturgical calendar, is the day that we commemorate the birth of John the Baptist. And on this holy feast, we remember that John came as the forerunner of the Lord, born to Elizabeth and Zechariah. Life is always worth celebrating. And when John is born, his father, Zechariah, who was previously mute, breaks forth into song, which he had not been able to do. You know, the thing that I always find funny is, you know, Zechariah has been stricken mute by the angel. And even though he is a mute, they sign to him like he can't hear which shows that really human nature doesn't change that much over time. People are just a little slow sometimes. But God opens the mouth of Zechariah, and he uses his speech to break forth in the song. And we call this song the Benedictus, means blessed be. And it's a song that has been within the liturgy of our church since that time. Zechariah begins, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. For he has visited and redeemed his people. Now Zechariah is praising God, but he's not merely praising God for the birth of his son. He's praising God because he knows the significance of the coming of his son. Because the son of Zechariah is to be the prophet. That he is to be the one who prepares the way for the son of the Most High. That John is to go before the Lord to prepare his ways. And the son of Zechariah then will proclaim the Son of God. And Zechariah sings that this one who is coming is the horn of salvation, raised up in the house of his servant David, that he is coming to redeem his people. And actually, at the time of John's birth, he's there already because he's in Mary's womb. Mary is there visiting Elizabeth as the days for her to deliver have come to pass. 
So God is going to make good on his promise. This is what Zechariah sings about, that he will fulfill all the words of the holy prophets, that he will fulfill the oath that he swore to our father Abraham. And this past June 24th, the Lord has visited his people. And the Lord has heard the prayers of his church. He has heard the prayers of his people who have prayed for almost 50 years that abortion would end. God has heard these prayers. The court's decision has not ended abortion. There is nothing, there's no law, there is no deliberation of man that will end abortion or will end any sin. But legally speaking, you know that access to abortion has been dealt a significant blow in these United States. We pray that it will be dealt a mortal blow. And I have to confess something to you. I have to confess that I have doubted God. And I confess that I have been Zechariah. You know, when the angel Gabriel appears to Zechariah and he says, you will have a son. Well, my wife is postmenopausal. I'm an old man. And that's what he said. He said, how shall I know this? Because, and he's nice about it though. He says, I am an old man. And my wife is advanced in years. And I was Zechariah. I believe that there was too much money in the abortion industry. I believe that people were too partisan. And I believe that too many of us have been infected with anti-Christian ideology for the Roe decision to ever become a relic of our past. I know that I'm not the only one, though. I know that many of us doubted that, many of our number. And we have, in great degree, lived as if we were not the bride of Christ, beautifully adorned for her husband, but we have lived as Elizabeth and Zechariah, too old, too tired, too desensitized, too far gone to witness this miracle of life. But God is gracious. And this is why he comes to visit and redeem his people. This is why he opens the womb of Elizabeth, because the Lord is always the one who opens the womb. And when Zechariah turns his attention to John, finally, what he says is this, you child will be called the prophet of the most high, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins. So when the prophet of the most high is born, he comes for that purpose. He comes to prepare the way for the son of the most high. And this is what John does throughout his life, that through his preaching of repentance, through his giving of baptismal water, the people know God's salvation and the forgiveness of their sins. And this is how we know these things as our very own, that it's through the forgiveness of our sins that we have knowledge of salvation. Where there is forgiveness of sins, there is also life and salvation. Jesus, when he's born and fully grown, he says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And that's why the Son of God enters into our human life. That's why he is conceived. That's why he undergoes human birth in order to give life. That God is born as we are in order that we might become like he is. That we who are born of man or woman might be born of God. And St. John tells us to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the power to become children of God, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. God loves life. And God loves children. And God loves having as many children of his own as he can. This is the one thing that the Father has always been on a quest for that the prophet Malachi declares, what was the young, the one God seeking? Godly offspring. Now from eternity, he has godly offspring. He has Jesus, his son. 
and the godly offspring of the Father comes. He was God of God, light of light, very God of very God. He is born in order that he might give his father more children, that the father of Jesus might become our father, that he might have many, many more godly offspring, that we might all receive adoption as his sons. So why do the sons of God mourn and lament and hate abortion? This is where we must be very careful. We know that many outright lies are told about abortion, that abortion is health care, that abortion is liberating, that abortion is a sacred right. But I would point out to you that many times as Christians, we miss the point about why abortion is evil. So hear me very carefully. For the Christian, abortion is not an issue of rights. See, rights are a quagmire. Because for, for people who are actually willing to have this discussion, we reach a certain impasse because the, the question is where do the rights of the mother end and where do the rights of the child begin? You can make no progress with this question. And the people who support these things understand this. They do not make scientific arguments about why they favor abortion. They cannot do that. What they do is they make a religious argument because they have imbued the idea of bodily autonomy with a religious aura. These things are sacred and holy and inviolate. They cannot deny the personhood of the unborn and so they deify the decision of the woman. And we get to this point in talking about rights. What Christians miss when they talk about rights, well, there is one thing that is true. The woman's womb is a sacred place. The thing that makes the woman's womb sacred is the one who dwells in the womb. That Jesus, when he comes, he undoes all of the problems with being a human being. Because when our first parents sinned, human conception and birth was marred by sin. At the time of the fall, God said in the garden to Eve, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Marred. And then we all together pray with David in the 51st Psalm. When we confess our sins, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. And in sin did my mother conceive but when the divine assumes the human, when God becomes an unborn child, then he sanctifies human life. And he sanctifies it in every stage from the beginning. The Son of God becomes what we are in order that we might become what he is. The Father is seeking to make all of the children of Adam, the children of of God. And so we continue with Zechariah. Zechariah sings that God sends Jesus to be the sunrise that shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. So that's where we were, in darkness, the shadow of, the, of death, the way that we confess in the 23rd Psalm, in the valley of the shadow, the darkest valley, that's where we were thinking that we had been completely abandoned until the sunrise dawns from on high, till the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. The light has dawned on our race. And it's in the light of Jesus' incarnation, it's in the light of him becoming a child, that we finally see that all of those children look exactly like Jesus, that every unborn child is created by God in order to be redeemed by God, and that God has come to visit and redeem his people as one of them. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, and he loves the least and most vulnerable 
He loves the weakest. If he didn't, he would not have become one of them. And you see that resemblance when you look at an ultrasound, when you look at all my lovely children, you see that they look exactly like Jesus because God has become what we are in order that we might become what he is. We lose so much of this in this, shall we call it a conversation that we have on this issue. You know, abortion as a sin precedes all of the things that you and I know about before Democrats, Republicans, Supreme Courts, all that nonsense. The early church responded to abortion because it was simply a part of their culture. And so we have to speak the truth. We speak the truth because God who creates life calls us into that life. It might be that the approaches that we take as we continue to do the things that Jesus says and he commands to care for the least and the weakest and the most vulnerable, we have even more golden opportunity. And you hear Jesus' words a little different in light of what we're faced with, because you know that Jesus says on the final day to his sheep, he says, truly, I say to you, as you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it to me. The least include the children at any stage. They include their mothers. And so it is true that there is much to do. There is much in many ways, we strive to fulfill these words of Jesus until he comes again. There's much for us to do as there is much for John to do, as he is going to grow up and prepare the way of the Lord. So there's a time and a place. We will do that. And yet there's also a time and a place to do like Zechariah and to simply praise God. And so we will stand and we will sing the common doxology. Praise God. 